Hello ladies, gentlemen and others, my name is Dan, the voice behind the Kaito Dan and welcome at long last to my first reaction slash discussion for the Ruby Volume 8 OST. Uh, yeah, we've had to wait a little bit longer than usual for this, um, understandably so of course, uh, for those of you who maybe have forgotten or didn't know in the first place. Uh, the reason why we had to wait a little bit longer than usual for this is predominantly because of a personal medical issue that was affecting the Williams family, um, as mentioned by Casey herself. Um, and like I've said in the past, I completely understood that decision. Obviously, the main priority is the personal well-being um, of everyone involved, not just the Williams family, but of course, everyone who has worked on this through another difficult year in all our lives. Um, and hopefully things are improving for Jeff and Casey on that front, and again, everyone else who has been struggling this year. Um, so yeah, that's why we had to wait all the way up until the last day of 2021 for this to drop. Much love to Casey, Jeff, Alex Abraham, I know Lamar Hall's on this again as well. Everyone who's worked on both the vocal songs and the score for their hard, hard work through this very tough year. Uh, please go and support the official release as well on Spotify, iTunes, um, supported YouTube uploads as well. And also as well, big thank you to Sirs and Madams Entertainment for providing uh, all of us, uh, not just me and everyone else who's doing reactions, um, videos with these songs with the accurate lyrics provided by Jeff. So big shout out to them as well. So yeah, what we're going to be doing, if you haven't seen any of these kind of reactions before, is I'm going to be having my first listens completely with uh, the seven songs that I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm not going to be doing the remix, which is for Touch the Sky, um, just because there's not really much to talk about on that front. And I'm not going to be doing the episode scores as well, just because that would take a little bit too long. Um, and this is already going to go on for quite a while. So, um, though I would say definitely go check out the episode scores. They're always fantastic. And I feel like Volume 8 score uh, as in a uh, whole is probably one of the strongest in the series. So again, definitely go check them out and have a good listen there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have my first listen to these songs and then I'm going to cut and uh, listen to them without talking because I am going to be talking through my first uh, reaction. And if you don't like that, tough break. But this ain't supposed to be a market substitute. So again, listen to the official releases. Then I'll cut back and I'll have a bit more of a deeper discussion. But one last thing I do really need to stress just please understand that these are not meant to be taken as 100% representations of everything that is involved in the series. Jeff and Casey have said in the past that they write these songs to be inspired by the events in the show first and foremost. Um, and just to make cool songs. And then there is some elements that do tie in, but again, very semi-canon at best. Okay, so we are starting off now with, of course, the intro song to Volume 8 for Every Life. I'm very excited to hear the full version of this. I thought the Volume 8 opening itself, in terms of the visual front, was probably one of the strongest in the series. So let's see what the full song has to offer, shall we? Count it down with me. Three, two, one. A hard rocking intro, as always. Ah, oh, it's so good to finally get this after all this time waiting. And then we get the shots coming in of uh, Team Ruby. Uh, shout out to the hashtag before after Ruby uh, trend. That was a lot of fun. But yeah, this is where start of the emotions are getting a little bit conflicted. We've had a lot of high point songs, a lot of hopeful songs. This is where it's starting to be a bit more warped and uh, divided. Ah, uh, it's so good to hear Casey again. It's so good to hear more of uh, Jeff's instrumentation. I, I, not, I'm probably gonna sing around a few times with these songs. I'm just sort of my lighting here for a sec. <laughs> oh, wait for it. Roses will never bloom. I can't do it as well as Arnold did with his, uh, with his sing-alongs. And of course, Casey is just phenomenal with her voice. It's incredible, her talent. 
yeah, we're starting to get some of that stuff again. Some things aren't going to work out well. We are going to fail a lot of times. There is going to be a lot of death. Uh, but it's not going to be easy, but we still got to keep on going because we got to fight for every life. And now we move on to the second half. Let's see what we got. Ooh. Ooh. There's a lot of re references already I'm seeing to uh, past intros. I'm getting that. Like, even Sacrifice is a reference. Oh, that, that, yeah, they're starting to feel like, okay, there's going to be some suffering, but we got to keep on going. There's been a lot of times where we stumbled, especially in Volume 7. Strange not victory, that classic uh, quote from Salem. Ugh. The flipping drums on this is killer as well. Oh! Oh, that second some roses! That's so goddamn good by KC. I'm thinking of, as well on that bit, uh, with some... Um, something on the vine, some limes went until soon. I wonder if that is meant to harken to the fate of Vine and Penny, of course, but you never know. Ooh. I'm getting chills and oh, that switch! Oh my god! They're starting to feel like this is the end, and understandably so. This is the first time they've had to deal with Salem, full front and center. This will be the day! Oh, that callback! The very first song! This will be the day we waited for. And of course, what's a Ruby song without a Jeff uh, guitar solo? Gotta love it, gotta love it. There's so many callbacks in this song. This is fantastic. I'm loving this. Oh. And again, it's just the, the fact that we're finally hearing a full song for the first time in a while. Brilliant. Ah, oh, Jeff, you're killing it, dude! Oh! Oh, that setup! I love it! Right on the vine. Yeah, again, it does feel like it is kind of like maybe hinting to Vine and Penny's fate. Ah! Uh, some wars will not end in peace. Oh! I just got a big smile on my face finally getting this. And fight for every life. Woo! Oh, that is so good. Oh my god, I'm so happy that we got, like, we're finally hearing the full intro song to Volume A. That was so kick-ass, I love it. There, there is just so many callbacks I noted. I've, I've got, like, a list of notes here, so I'm going to be looking down a bit. But yeah. There's so many callbacks um, to past songs, and understandably so, because it's continuing the trend of building on from the past. Uh, obviously, in terms of like the overall tone, it is dark as hell. Um, if you just gone by like how past songs since the Fall of Beacon have like gone in tone, uh, Volume Four with uh, Let's Just Live, it's like let's not let the dark of the past stop us from living. A very hopeful song there after. A lot of dark. Volume 5, uh, with the triumph, was, okay, the dark times are still coming, but we have to endure, and we will endure. So, still feeling hopeful, even in amongst everything starting to still feel a bit uh, tense and dark and sinister. Volume 6, we had Rising, which was, if we stay united, and it'll keep us moving through that new darkness. So, now we're starting to focus on... Uh, everyone focusing on the world. It's like, we need to stick together. We can't just uh, remain divided. Uh, of course, this was, of course, building on from Team Ruby finally being uh, reunited. And then in Volume 7, uh, the start of the Atlas arc, it was all about trusting love. Like the title says of the song, we need to spread positivity to fight the negativity. And that was the core theme of that volume. Here, it's pretty much just saying, like, we're now starting to maybe start to be rocked by that negativity. 
have we done everything right in the past? We've got a lot of doubt and fear of what we feel is an inevitable failure, a lot of inevitable sacrifices and losses that are going to come. Before, they were feeling hopeful that they would not they would be able to stop any more unnecessary sacrifices or... Um, or like they would be able to stop more people dying and meeting the same fate as like uh, Pira or back then Penny. Um, but even so, like for as dark as this is, there is still that small light of hope feeling like we have to still keep fighting. That's why the song's called For Every Life. They know that there is going to be a lot more struggles and a lot more deaths, a lot more conflict, even amongst themselves. But they still need to keep on fighting because... If they don't, who else will? Like, I'm just noting here, we had, we said goodbye to all the things we loved. I think that's a callback to time to say goodbye. Uh, we had try to rise, which is, I feel, rising. That's a callback there. Our plans of triumph torn apart. The triumph there. And, uh, of course, as I was going on in the reaction, uh, this will be the, will this be the day that we always feared? This will be the day, of course, the initial Ruby song. I think that's like, nicely fitted in where it's like the tone of the music it was like it was dark it was heavy the guitars was like very aggressive same with the drums but you still had uh sort of those lighter moments especially with casey's uh voices uh voices uh vocals yeah but it's like volume three is like the darkest uh intro song and whereas this is still dealing with very dark matters and like the most defeated the heroes are starting to feel of like being unable to stop the inevitable, they're still keeping hope, and I love that element that is portrayed in both the lyrics and the instrumentation. Fantastic stuff. Um, this, in terms of like where this ranks on my favorite intro songs, I think "Time to Say Goodbye" is still going to be my favorite. That is just like I love everything about like the the instrumentation, the lyrics, and like so like blood pumping energies, and even that was starting to hint towards some of the darker stuff to come. Um, but this is like really super good and uh, along with the fantastic visuals of the opening it's a perfect combination um, so yeah this is definitely going to rank high amongst my favourites in terms of intro songs uh, so yeah fantastic stuff what a great way to start off uh, the Volume 8 OST next up we have uh, The Sky Is Falling uh, which was from the uh, the chase scene with uh, Yang, Jean and Ren chasing after the Hound with uh, Oscar and his teeth, and that I, that was a fast-paced uh, scene in itself. I'm sure this is going to be as equally fast as much as it was heard in the scene itself. Uh, so let's see what we have in full. And I believe that this is the one that's got Lamar. Yeah, it's got Lamar Hole on this. So we're going to have a bit more of him. Always fun to hear. So uh, let's see what it sounds like. Count it down with me. Three, two, one. Straight into that high energy. Fantastic start already. And perfect because there's like, we rushed right into that scene, so why not start off super fast? Ain't this like, I, I was just thinking there, the guitar riffs are giving me big uh, Nintendo 64 guitar riff vibes. Like, the intro to WCW versus NWO Revenge. It sounds very much like that. That's just a weird tangent to have, I'm sorry. And again, keeping that like very sub, uh, like almost like subjugating feeling. We're starting to like really submit to the darkness around us. Oh, race! I mean, it felt like a race. Ah, oh. sky is falling. Oh my god, this is like so good. I was like, I picture in my head as well, like the chase scene, and it's like. A fantastic tune to it as well. And this is... It feels like this is kind of like paralleling, uh, paralleling to uh, Touch the Sky. Which kind of makes sense now that we got that remix for it. Because uh, that, that that was like super high. This is like really starting to feel super low. Oh. Slow... That's what it feels like. It feels like a slow decay of hope. Ooh. This is just like a f a so defeated feeling, but at the same time, it's got that energy that like, they still need to keep on grabbing and like trying to claw their way out because if they don't, Oscar's screwed. 
And so is everyone else. Ooh. This is so fantastic. I'm loving this. I can't stop head bopping as well. Flipping drums. I lo I, like, I love, again, the, the parallels to touch the sky. Like, you can reach out and touch it. Now, you need to reach out and hold down. And hold on, because everything's starting to crumble around us. Is this where Lamar's going to come in? Yep! Oh, that piano in the background! Yo, that line! Casket! This is a different kind of, like, verse from Lamar. I'm, I'm losing my mind here. Need therapy? I think we all did after, uh, much of this volume. Holy hell, that verse from Lamar! That is so different to what we've usually gotten from him. Like, in Volume 7, did we get, like, uh, a very, like, poppy and very dance beat from him? <laughs> and this is, like, very, like, self-defeated as well. Oh, my God. This is so good. This, this feels like such a struggle of a tune. It's like, you know, the panic's, like, the, the fast pace. It works for the chase scene. But it's working for like the desperation, like the panic as well. Flipping guitars as well. It's like the, the fast bass guitar and the drums. Oh my god, that was sick as hell. Okay, so uh, yeah, the sky is falling. Warp over tune, right? Like again, it's like it feels like it is kind of um, following on from Touch the Sky, which was. The most hopeful that these heroes have felt in a long while, like they've felt a, re a rekindling of their fire within and so much so that they feel like they could just like fly through the sky, reach out and touch an endless uh, positivity out there. Things are starting to feel a bit more hopeful in spite of everything going on and they're, they're trying to keep that positive going. But now it's like, but you know that scene in Toy Story where Buzz is like uh, trying to fly in uh, Sid's house and he's reaching out, but then he comes falling down and crashes? That's what it feels like to me. It feels like you're that high of like flying through the air, you're in the sky and it's perfect. And here comes hard reality crumbling down alongside you and the sky. It's fantastic. And I love that fast tempo beat that uh, very much fit for the high energy set piece. Like... If you need a vocal song to go through, like, a biker chase going through, like, chasms and monsters all over the place, this is the way to go about it. But I do love as well that, like, it's almost fitting the high amount of, like, fear and, like, confusion and stress. Like, these guys, the, the kids are, like, struggling to figure out where to go next, what direction to take. And it almost feels like the sky is falling down all around them. That's the kind of energy that this song kind of provides as well with, like... You don't have a chance to think. You don't have a, a, a moment of pause. Everything's going at like a breakneck pace. Um, I love that line about like staring at the cast and trying to move past it from Lamar's piece, which was, again, it's like I think that's probably one of the strongest Lamar segments we've had in a song. It's like in before, he's done like a mixture of like very positive and like still like aware of like the emotional like crux going on. But they do kind of keep that very uh, bopping, like, uh, kind of fun kind of vibe about it. It's fast paced. You don't have a moment of pause. So I, I, what's a perfect accompaniment to this song? Fast paced rap. You got, like, lyrics going all around you. It's like, almost like the words going on in your head. Like, you're trying to scramble all the way through it and find some kind of rational thought. You also get, like, a, a, a few mentions of, like, uh, floodgates. Like, again, like, that wash of, like, stress and... Fear, it's like it's coming down. You have no way out, and it's like one more sin. It's like just piling on every single kind of like negative emotion that is being felt by these kids. Uh, like the use of cover up your eyes. It feels almost like someone is feeling too much, and like they're they're trying to like turn away almost. And I think that works in perfectly with one particular scene that comes after this. The stuff with Ren um, and Yang. 
it's it feels very defeated by the end uh, especially with some of these lyrics as well um the talk of like final days and again by the end of the scene Ren is starting to feel like th- there is no chance that they're going to make it out of this okay there's every single thing that they've tried to do to help it's caused more misery and again the the different kind of approach to Lamar's segments like fan freaking task it uh fan freaking tastic I should say as well and one other thing I was like starting to feel is like it almost feels like he may as well he might also be talking about Oscar's feelings because he was starting to feel like he's slowly losing more and more, uh, more and more of his own self-identity and he's starting to in a sense die as he's being reborn and rekindled into the next Ospin life and um, the more he's starting to like stress about using magic again um, I think that, again like that casket line that spoke out to me so big and that feels very much in line with Oscar's feelings so I wonder if uh, like uh, while the bulk of the song is focusing more on like the group as a whole feeling like everything's coming down after we were feeling so high um, that segment by Lamar is focusing perhaps predominantly on Oscar where he's starting to feel like l- less and less of himself and feeling more and more like just the next step in uh, the reincarnation but yeah, this was really damn good. I, again, I, I love that fast-paced energy. It's perfect for the scene itself. You saw me head-bopping a lot. And in terms of like the very like hopeful tune of Touch the Sky, this feels so heavy as well, and I'm loving it. Uh, and again, Lamar, fantastic job, mate. That was probably one of your strongest uh, uh, involvements in the OST, in my opinion. Okay, now this is the song I think I was the most excited for because it's a Nora-related song and I think she had a fantastic volume. Um, And I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of heartfelt emotion in this because it is so, like, passionate and personal towards uh, Nora's strife um, and personal doubts about herself, a lot of self-doubt issues uh, in her journey. So I'm eager to see how this song um, embodies that as much as it does, again, as all with these songs, inspired by but not meant to like fully represent. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm eager to get into this um, and see if it's probably going to be one of my favorites. I feel like it is just because of like what I enjoyed from the bit we saw in Volume Eight, like the fight against Ironwood, um, and again just knowing like the personal context as well. So let's get into it once again. Count it down with me: three, two, one. Ooh, that is not the the star I thought it was gonna have. Like very. Oh, that that's a little chill down Mister Point. That like very soothing. But then that comes that drums. Hmm. I wonder is this from uh, Ren's point of view? Because it feels like it's talking to Nora. Very much in the same way as like their scene in uh, Risk. And we start to get a little bit more of that energy. Builds up to the chorus. Made from all those scars. Yeah, I think this is from Ren's point of view. There we go. Oh, I did not expect that start, but I loved it. And again, it's like... Very uplifting, trying to like um, lift someone's head up from feeling down. Hmm. Actually, I think that bit might be. Um... I wonder if that's Emerald Focus as well, because that's more in line with like Herb Journey. Like she's made a lot of mistakes in the past, whereas Nora, I don't think she's got a mistake feeling in her. It's more like she feels like she's. I guess in, like in a way inadequate. So I think that segment there, I think that leans more in towards Emerald, and that makes sense because she was still a feature in the scene that this song appeared in. And I like the tone shift again. Oh, that's that's cool. Like look at like compare like younger self to looking at you now. You would be impressed. Strength and beauty feels like that's another like uh, Ren moment there. The glow? Is that Ren's semblance? Yeah, 
it feels like it's like we we've obviously gone through a lot of struggles but look at the, all the positives you've had and i think that's a very inspiring song for us as well obviously we've gone through a lot of uh uh, trials and tribulations these past two years or so, but trying to look at all the positives you have, that will help you get through all those dark signs. And I think that's very much like what Ren was doing with Nori. It's like, he was speaking about her strength, her beauty, all the things that he loved about her, to try and like help lift her spirit again and feel like she isn't as worthless as she may be feeling. Ooh. Ooh, is that Penny there? Wish upon the star, because that's in line with the uh, friend. This feels like it's got a lot of things going on in this. Okay, this is taking on some many twists and turns I did not expect. There's the drop. Always love that. Doesn't mean. Yeah, this, it feels like it's very like in development. It's like you, you're still looking forward to. Uh, there's a lot of progress still to be made, but don't let that override the fact that you've done a lot of good things in the past. But of course, it is like a predominantly Nora song. Even with the like again those elements, it feels like it's leaning more towards Emerald and Penny there. Oh, this. This is a dark way to end the song. This is interesting. I'm, I'm surprised by like how dark this is going for the end here, and it's dragging out as well. I wonder if that's just like meant to give a bit more space towards the end of the uh, the fight. Okay, so that was really damn good. And I again, as I was saying as well. There's a lot more to this than I was thinking. I thought this was just going to be a predominantly Nora song. But there were some elements in that that did feel like it was leaning towards some other characters. Um, I mentioned like there was a line about redemption um, and the choices you've made. Let me see if I can just quickly find this. Uh, yeah, mistakes that you've made will stay in the past. Redemption is yours if you follow that path. That feels very much like the key Emerald uh, segment. Um, because she's obviously made a lot of mistakes, she's followed the wrong people, um, and she's trying to maybe move forward and make up for those mistakes, um, and redemption is hers if she follows the path. She's, uh, she was at that point where she's, like, unsure whether or not she does want to stick around with the heroes, but in the end she does make the, that choice, so she's the one that made that choice to follow that path. So, right now, redemption is hers, at least for the moment. Let's find it again. Uh, there's no need to wish upon a star. Just open your eyes to who you are. Uh, the path to yourself is never clear. When you're lost, you're growing. Have no fear. You'll reappear and rise up from your darkest day. Look at yourself and say, uh, it's okay. Okay. So, yeah, that feels like that is maybe a bit more towards Penny because she is, um... She's obviously, like, wished upon the stars, like, mentioned in Friend, um, and she's still trying to find herself, she's trying to find being a normal girl, despite all the people who have tried to force her as either a weapon for the army, uh, the protector of Mantle, which, even though she does adopt, it's still something that is kind of inflicted on her, and comes with some additional baggage. And also, of course, being a maiden, uh, and then dealing with the virus stuff. There's a lot that is pressed on her, and all she's trying to do is find the path to herself. Which, as the lyric says, uh, the yeah, the path to yourself is never clear. It's not an easy path to take, uh, trying to find um, an identity that you're satisfied with. But it is possible um, if you just keep on looking for it, if you keep on trying. So I feel like maybe that's a very loose connection to Penny. I feel less confident in that than the stuff of Emerald. But considering like still like it does kind of fit in some ways to Penny, I'm, I'm willing to say like it's a very loose connection. But overall, this is a, a, of course a heavy song fitting perfectly for Nora. Um, and one thing I, I wanted to note off from the start, ironically, is the start. Uh, we had like a very soothing intro, like sort of like a trancey beat going on, um, and then Casey going ooh, like like humming her way into the vocals. 
And considering that this is definitely uh, sort of bent, uh, meant to feel like it's sung from Ren's point of view to Nora, like uh, a vocal song version of his discussion with her in Risk, it feels kind of right that there is that soothing start because it's like, obviously Nora is very conflicted, she's in a very uh, sensitive state, so you don't want to like rush in, you don't want to like be like aggressive like your support, you do need to take a softer touch, and that's kind of like what Ren did. So I like the fact that the instrumentation kind of goes along with that, like gently easing his way into uh, giving her the support that she needs. Um, and then he gets into uh, that more like higher energy that is not just fitting for the fight itself that this was featured in, but it's like more attuned to Nora. She is very high energy. She's very bubbly. She's still very forward thinking. Um, and I like that it kind of builds towards that as like Ren is trying to bring Nora back into that mindset. But that core theme is like pretty much saying it's like it's okay to have self-doubt. It's okay to feel lost on your journey. It's okay to feel like you're unsure if you're deserving of taking a path to redemption but in a sense don't let that um fear and doubt stop you from not just taking a chance still trying to grow but also don't let it stop you from acknowledging the accomplishments you've had like in the sense of emerald she should feel happy that she herself made the choice to uh, leave the villains, leave Cinder, and join the heroes, and actually do good. She's actually made the choice herself. That is fantastic. Penny, she's obviously gone through a lot of uh, difficult situations where she's been uh, manipulated or, like, lent in ways that she had no control of her own actions or wasn't given the chance to make her own actions. Uh, but at the same time, she was still able to protect the people of Mantle. She was still able to uh, protect the power of the Maiden. That's a lot of success there. And for Nora, she has come so far from... We, when we saw that she started out as like a very meek, very timid orphan, um, she's... Like, she's like a complete contrast to the Nora that we know of for the bulk of her time. Very high energy, very self-confident, very outgoing, and willing to uh, not just be, like, super strong, but also super kind and super fun and loving. And that is, like, a huge path of growth that she's gone through since those days where she first met Ren and was almost, like, counting on Ren for uh, helping her grow and gain uh, the strength that she needs. And I do like the fact that it did feel like it was coming from Ren's perspective, given, of course, the scene in Risk. Um, and it fits as well for him because he himself was feeling those same kind of doubts. Like, he was unsure uh, if he was making the right choices, if he was uh, being actually able to do the right thing, if he was actually accomplishing anything. But he was able to move past those self-doubts and uh, use his own experiences and accomplishments and growth in that a aspect of self-doubt to try and help someone else in a very similar way. And the, of course there was the mention of the scars, um, and uh, like Nora, she was seeing those scars as like another example of her, uh, just being the girl that breaks stuff, a bit that's being strong and hit stuff, and she feels like she failed in that aspect because all she did was just be not able to take the power that she was trying to conduct and fight and protect Penny with and all she got was scars but Ren was painting them as like a sign of her strength to overcome so much and like deal with that kind of pain that those scars would give you and still come out here still alive still able to fight she just needs to have that energy and that will to do so it painted it as like obviously it's not an easy journey um, and it's very much aware of that. I like the fact that it's not trying to gloss over all the struggles that have come, are happening, and will come in the future. Um, which is a, like a very mature approach to that kind of discussion, even outside of a song. But it's just that sense of like, don't ignore yourself and who you are. Because that you need that kind of like inspiration to keep you going. And again, it feels right for Ren to do that. So yeah, I, I love... Or like the positive message. I like how mature it approaches it in the lyrics. Um, I love how well it fits for not just Ren and Nora, but also like Emerald and a little bit of Penny. And overall, like I love that like soothing start into the high energy. 
Um, and even when it is still going like fast paced and like drums and like the guitars and that, it's still very like uh, trying to uh, keep a positive vibe. It almost sounds a bit like um, like morning follows night, uh, which was again a kind of like a, com- a conflict of like self doubt and like. Um, almost like feeling defeated from Blake's point of view with Sun who was providing a more like inspirational and like you don't have to do this by yourself like support is like a perfect merger of those kind of like two elements in that song represented again here in this song which I mean I loved like Morning Follows Night I love this both kind of feel like um, stage musical performances like that third act like lift up the hero kind of song let's just get it out of the way judging by the short runtime. It's probably the same length that we had in the uh, the episode Midnight where this first appeared. Um, which is going to be interesting to talk about, but I'm going to save that until afterwards just so I'm sure. And I'm still going to do a few re-listens afterwards because, uh, spoilers, I haven't listened to some of these songs in a few months. So, uh, yeah, let's get into it, shall we? Count it down with me once again. Three, two, one. It's like that. Piano is still very chilling. It's like heavy notes straight into the aggressive uh, and then impo- uh, like dominating lyrics. Ooh, especially like down the shut. It almost feels like, again, like a very Disney villain song in a sense. Ugh. This was a good moment in that episode as well. Like, it just feels so enswarming all on Cinder. And now we're starting to get into the, like, mean spirited stuff. And yeah, that is it. Okay, so let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. It is a shame that it is pretty much the exact same thing we heard in the show. Um, and it's a shame, in, like, in general, that it is so short. Um, but we need to talk about, like, that from a very understandable, uh, point of view. Uh, could be because of the COVID situation making things, like, very tight in terms of, like, working schedules and stuff like that. Um, it could also obviously be involving the, uh, the situation with the Williams family. Or it could just be the intended purpose to be that short. And we've had that before as well with, uh, I was, I was thinking, like, we've had it before with, like, a song that kind of didn't meet people's expectations in terms of like the content we got uh in bad luck charm we had like a, a big build up and then like a few verses and the chorus and that was it we didn't get like a full length song as compared to like most ruby songs i do think this was actually done intentionally um because there's i mean there's plenty of examples uh in all kinds of media where there are short songs uh, that are very succinct and like very to the point with their messages and like their the instrumentations like they don't overblow. Um, but I was th- I was thinking about like a, a good example of this and I think I found the perfect one. Um, in Aladdin, uh, the Disney film, um, we there's uh, the bit at the end where Jafar uh, he has his villain song and. By that point, you and many people would expect villain songs to be the big blowout song, much like uh, uh, Be Prepared or Hellfire. Um, but with Aladdin uh, and this uh, villain song, uh, it wasn't an original song. It was a reprisal of Prince Ali. And I, I I, do know that in terms of like some reviews and some reactions I've seen, some people were a bit let down that there wasn't a full-on original song for Jafar. And I've always felt it always worked for the moment. Uh, at that point in the film, Jafar had won. He was uh, an almighty uh, wizard. He was the sultan. He was com- in control of the genie. He was like completely... Like he felt like he was the victor. He had already won. He's got all the power, so he doesn't really need a big long boast, much like past villain songs would have had, which is before their assumed victory or something like that. Like be prepared is like the build up to the uh, initial plan of action against Mufasa. Hellfire is Judge Frollo's um, internal conflict with uh, his feelings for Esmeralda. It's not at the point of most villain songs where there is. Like, the, the setup into their villainous schemes. 
in this instance, Jafar's song was after his scheme had worked. So he doesn't need to boast about his power or about what he wants to do. He's already got that power and he's already accomplished his goals. But what he can do is tear down the heroes, especially Aladdin. And that's what it, this song is. Um, he's inflicting further suffering on Jafar, I don't know, on Jafar, on Jasmine, the Sultan and Aladdin. And it's a pure humiliating moment for Aladdin as he's revealed as Ali. Thus why Jafar doesn't have an original song, he instead twists uh, Prince Ali, which was a big boastful song, but more for a hero. And he spins it around with like, talking about how it's a con, it's like, oh, how ain't it a shame that Prince Ali is actually street rat Aladdin. Aladdin, Jasmine, the Sultan, they don't deserve anything more than just that exact moment of shame where the lie is revealed, uh, the two will not be together, and Jafar is going to rule Agrabah as an almighty uh, wizard, an almighty sultan, a so sorcerer, and stuff like that. So he doesn't need to drag on, so that's why he doesn't get a big, long, boastful song there. Um, and it builds up towards the end, like the seemingly undeniable end of Aladdin's life, and the undeniable end of anything that can stop Jafar's victory. Um, which acts as like one last gleeful mock. That's that worked perfectly for that scene because again, it's like a tear down of the heroes. So you manipulate uh, the song that was used to uh, set up the lie. You turn it into a humiliation, and you're already on top. You've got everything you need. So why boast? You want to savor your victory, throw them out, and then remain on top. That's what Jafar's song was all about, and it worked perfectly for that scene. And again, we did kind of get uh, a proper villain song for Jafar in return uh, of Jafar, uh, fittingly enough. So he needed a villain song there. He didn't need one here. I think that same kind of like mindset of like working for the context of the scene rather than working for the structure of most songs is what they went with with the truth. Um, it's got a very similar goal where it doesn't need to drag on because uh, the ma the madame is just strictly belittling Cinder and trying to break her spirit. In the sense like the only thing that you should be thinking about Cinder is these chores. You shouldn't be thinking about oh hopes of breaking away or you shouldn't think about uh, the chance of love coming at any point. No, the only thing you should be caring about is subserving to me, serving to uh, my daughters, serving to our customers. That's the only thing that you not only should be thinking about, but is the only thing that you deserve to get because you don't deserve love. That's why anything else that isn't that uh, like pile on of orders is all those kind of like insults and barbs, like any trace of thought is being snuffed out. Um, and you get that in like the instrumentation as well. Like, with every real strong bob of insults, it's supported by a heavier tone in the music. Like, if you listen back um, to where she says, Shut your mouth. The, like, uh, the heavy piano keys there, saying for, No one said that you should think. And then, of course, that long tirade at the end, where it builds and builds and builds and builds, and it's heavier and heavier and it's stronger. The notes are, like, really impacting your ears, because that is, like, the last heavy bit of crushing Cinder's spirit. So yeah, it's like, again, that final nail of the coffin, the truth. That truth, the first time that it's mentioned, is the only time that it needs to be mentioned, because it's, it needs to hang in the air. That's why the song ends with, no one will ever love you. Any kind of instance that she sees Cinder feeling hopeful or, like, positive of herself, like, it's immediate squash. Doesn't need to drag it on, she just wants to focus on bringing Cinder back into her subserviency and getting back to doing her chores. What else has needed to be said, uh, in a sense? A longer song would really just be repeating what's already been said. So, I think that is why this song is shorter. I don't think it's... I, well, there may be some elements that might be involving the COVID stuff or the stuff that affected the Williams family. I think this was intended right from the start to be this short. Yes, it is a shame that Cinder's first song is so short. Um, and yes, it's a, say, a shame as well that, um, as many of us kind of hoped, uh, were hoping for, uh, there's no performances or uh, featuring of uh, Amanda Lee, who was the the voices of um, the the two sisters, uh, the two stepsisters, um, who is a noted singer, who's done Ruby covers as well, so it felt like that could have been a good 
uh, platform for her to be a guest star on this song. Um, and that is a shame there, but like, the song's got a goal and it fixates on it perfectly in its short length. It's aggressive, it's mean-spirited, it's cutting, it's bereft of any subtlety at all. Like, there's no, like, uh, subtle, like, deeper, like, oh, maybe it's, if you twist the words like this, maybe it could be interpreted like that. Like, no, there's no love in this song and there's no subtlety in uh, the themes and messages. There's always going to be a chance later on for a fuller Cinder, uh, Cinder song, especially since that one would be more with Cinder's point of view. This one isn't. This one is directed directed at Cinder. Um, so maybe much like how Jafar got a fuller song in the sequel to Aladdin, uh, maybe in the future when Cinder either uh, goes rebel against Salem once again, or she's uh, t heading towards maybe her final days as a character, she will get a fuller song. You never know. Um, again, the, the complaints are understandable, and I too wouldn't mind something maybe a little bit longer, but for what we uh, got, it is still effective, and it is still a fantastic song. Let's, like, not let all the, like, uh, disputes about whether or not it should have been longer or the disappointment that it is short uh, override the fact that this is still a fantastic song. Like, the piano is so perfectly utilized here to, like, feel enchanting and like soothing but then build to those heavier notes and that aggression um Casey's voice it's like always fantastic but this is she like really kills it on ballads but this is like one of the most aggressive ballads she's had to do and she knocks it out of the park so yeah I think for now this is a really good song and I don't I, I hope that the uh, the disappointment elements to it that I can, again, understand, I hope that doesn't override the actual quality in the song. Like, it's still damn effective. It's still so, like, damning and so insulting and so powerful, in, even in its shortness. And it's still an effective piece that does support Cinder's arc. So, yeah, I, I, I may have gone on, like, a very wild tangent, especially with, like, the Jafar stuff, but I feel like... That's the best way I can explain why I like this song and why I think it works despite its uh, its flaws. This one is probably going to be one of the more heartfelt ones. It's uh, It was playing during the reunion scene of the heroes. So yeah, this is probably going to be very heartfelt. Um, I'm sure this is where most of the, like maybe the shipping elements will come into play. Uh, but again, keep in mind, semi-canon, very loose, the whole jazz. Um... And we only heard like a very small snippet, so we're going to be hearing a lot more of this um, compared to like some of the other songs that we've heard like a, a decent amount of. So uh, yeah, I'm very eager to get into this one and finally complete all the sets in terms of like hearing the full songs. So once again, three, two, one. Ooh. Again, fantastic start to the song. And Casey just, Casey always kills her with ballad songs, doesn't she? Like, the fact that she's able to do, like, rock songs, and, like, very bubbly club songs as well, but also ballads, just shows her versatility, like, one of a kind. Mm. Oh, God, this is giving me, like, big, um, like, wings and home vibes already. And I'm, I'm imagining this is mostly from Blake's perspective because that was like the predominant reunion of that scene. But there was a few others in there that I'll, I'll talk about, I'm sure. Mm. Of course, this was like the first major time many of these guys have been split up since um, around uh, the Haven time. And even, of course, before then, when first time after Beacon. Casey! Goddamn magical voice of yours, eh? It's just like something you should like hold up a candle to at a concert. I'm sure this is going to be fantastic whenever we do get concerts again for uh, Ruby songs. Treasure of my life. So that's where the song, uh, the title comes in. Because I don't think we had like an idea of the title for this one until now. Loving the viol uh, violin there. 
this is uh, such an oddity as well in this OST, considering like how heavy and like fast paced all the other songs are. Like the only other one that would be coming close to this is Friend. Oh, this is gonna be. Uh, I know I've obviously said like semi canon stuff in terms of like the context and especially in the shipping element, but I can see a lot of ship art being made uh, in regards to this. This is definitely so much so in like Blake and like Ruby and Weiss. In fact, like both sides, they obviously wanted to be like sticking together through everything that happened in this volume, but uh, circumstances and difficulties didn't make it quite possible for a good chunk of time. I'm getting like chills and it ain't because of the cold. And I, again, this is such a good, like, uh, good representation of like the versatility in Casey's song, uh, Casey's vocals, Jeff's musicals, uh, the, the songs in Ruby for general. Like, we got these rocker songs, we got those bop songs, we got songs that'll hit you right in the heart, like this one. And again, this is also like very thin for us as well, because like how divided many of us are feeling right now. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I say that now, I'm starting to get a little bit teary. Still trying to keep a little bit of hope going on in there. Tell it, Casey! Go on! Oh. oh my lord, this is so good. I'm loving this. This just feels like a, the rare gentle hug of a song that we needed, the characters needed. Ugh. I'm trying not to get emotional. I haven't even got to friend again. You gotta treasure those small moments as much as you can while you're with each other. Because you never know when you are going to be divided. That was so good. That was really, really sweet that. Ah, uh, that was nice. Okay. What can I say in terms of, like, what you expect for Ruby Ballads? It's, like, so goddamn beautiful. And Casey's, like, has got such an enchanting range to her vocals. I, I always said plenty about, like, how incredible her versatility is and range. Um, but, yeah, it's, like, so goddamn beautiful. And, um, and obviously, like, like, it's got a big theme of trying to fight... Uh, the concerns that comes with like separation and valuing the bonds and time that you do have with each other, like treasuring them. Um, and in terms of like the context that is like there with uh, Ruby, um, it does feel like the strongest is again with Blake and Jang because that was like the the staple uh, notable reunion in that moment. Though that, again, there was a lot of them, but like some of the lyrics and like the with that context in mind, it feels very much in line with them. And that makes sense, because this was the first time that those two have been divided since, um... Uh... Well, since they got back together, really. And obviously, with, um, Blake still dealing with life post-Adam, she's still trying to find herself, trying to keep things together, especially on top of everything else going on in their lives. And that degree of separation between them, concerns about whether or not they will like maybe be at odds after not agreeing, despite saying that um that they they pro they promise to be together when they need them. But there's also like other bonds that we got in that moment that this song works great with as well. Like Red and Nora, um Oscar and Ruby to an extent as well, depending on how you feel on their relationship, if it's romantic or not. Um 
And even, like, another big one as well, Ruby and Yang. Like, they had, like, some big concerns about being separated. And this was a rare instance of those two not being on the same page. The whole volume started off with those two kind of leading the charge of which path do we want to go. And um, they were obviously very concerned about each other. Uh, and I, I, I know that it might feel a little bit disingenuous that we got this song about separation and, like, feeling concerned about whether or not the other half will come back or if we are going to be uh, better if we come back despite our disagreements. And I know, again, it might feel disingenuous because in context, I think the heroes were only separated for about two days. It, like, there was a few lyrics like noting of like how slow time does go, almost like sands of time. Um, and as you would expect, especially for like Blake and Ruby, um, and Weiss as well, like, everyone that was waiting at the Schnee Manor whilst everyone else was kind of out in the thick of the conflict, and especially, um, when they lost, uh, like, being able to contact them on scrolls, sometimes, though, that time does kind of flow by really slow. Like, I'm sure many of us have felt that way, like, in schools or in meetings. Sometimes hours go by a lot slower than they actually are, so... I think that's an understandable feeling, even with that short period of time separated. And again, the lyrics help out there. Um, and again, those mixed emotions about uh, the fact that this was a rare internal conflict as well, kind of like adds on to it. So it's not just about, oh, we're separated. It's like, we're separated not just by distance, but like being on the same page and being on the same thoughts and whether or not we're feeling like if that could cause further division, especially so tentatively after they have only just started to reunite. And they were also kind of at the odds with each other during uh, Volume 6, where even with the apathy involved, they were kind of like, I don't want to go to Atlas on Weiss's part. Ruby still wanted to move forward. Yang and Blake were having some uh, tension there. So they've had a lot of like straining moments as a bond. And this was like one of the biggest ones where they were not just physically divided, but like maybe... Uh, like emotionally or like uh, tactically divided as well. So I, 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 that kind of helps this song have a bit more weight to it beyond just the distant side, which kind of gets a bit wonky even with a short time. Um, and it's like, of course, like it also discusses like how strong these bonds are. Like even with this short period of time to get uh, separated, like that absence is felt immensely. Um, which is one of the motivations why they are still fighting on. So yeah, this was just another beautiful song. Um, I'm glad that we finally got the full versions. Like uh, Again, I'm sure some people will take it on the ship in front and go wild with it. Please be respectful on that front. But yeah, this was like another like so enchanting song. And I'm glad that the lyrics do kind of support uh, and strengthen some of like, the divide even with that short period of time. Um, so yeah, that's all of, like, the, the songs that we haven't heard in full yet, but now we're gonna go on to Friend, uh, which was, of course, the credit song. Um, and I'm just gonna jump straight into it, and I'm gonna be talking through it because it's something we've already heard of before. And, uh, this was, like, a, the, a painful song to end on, considering everything that happened in that finale. And, of course, the, uh, the fact that this is... The, Po seemingly the uh, the end of Penny's uh, songs usage, I guess. Because this was obviously her end, and this was it started off. I like the fact that it does start off with this dark, um, like almost reaching out in a black void sort of vibe. Because that's what Penny kind of felt like for the longest time. She was. Lost for purpose, lost for identity, lost for uh, control of her life. But she starts to slowly get that freedom. And I've, it feels like this is like a retrospective of not just um, her, her time in Atlas. It's a retrospective of her whole life. Like obviously she, t uh, the lyrics talk about like wishing on a star, wanting a friend. And then she does get a friend in Ruby. So I like the fact that this is, um, if this is the end for Penny and I kind of hope it does, I don't. Wanted to be brought back again if it's gonna like cheapen or like maybe add some dents to how strong a moment this was to lose her like this. So I'm glad that it's kind of like a retrospective of Penny's wants and desires and her life. And of course, as you've seen here, the beautiful artwork by uh, AG Nunsuch. 
And I like the fact that they kind of like... It almost feels like Penny in a way is kind of giving us a comforting hug because... She's always someone that tries to promote a positive message. She always wants to do what she can to bring joy to people. She wants not just uh, her own desires of wanting friends and being seen as a real girl. But she's a protector, a fighter. She wants to keep those she loves safe and sound. And in this really dark moment that we're in, where she's... That line... Mm. It's like, again, this line of like... Uh, I try not to lose my, my, my thread of thinking here, but also like try not to get emotional again. But we've gone through that dark period now where she's dead. Everything's kind of falling apart for the heroes. But it's almost like, even in death, Penny is trying to tell us and tell her friends that it's alright. You, I'll, It'll be okay, just keep moving forward, in a sense. And um, and she's she's happy for that because she's, she did end up sacrificing so much. <laughs> the references to uh, past lines. But she's, she's done everything to try and make people happy. And I love the fact that this is such a positive, uplifting song. Even at the end, when everything's gone to hell. If this was like a very dark song like Sacrifice, that would probably work for like the dark tone of the endings of the volume. But in terms of like representing Penny, it's best to go with this like... Almost like somber approach. So yeah, I, I very much love this. This is probably my favorite song, and I know it won the um, the uh, the best song at the Oscars. Oh, deservedly so as well. So yeah, I I very much love this song. It's very enchanting, very bubbly and bright, but there is kind of like a a somber edge to it, where it's like it's aware of um, the sacrifices and the struggles that Penny went through. But it's building up to like one last bit of hope. One last bit of uplifting spirit that Penny wants to carry on and hope lives on in her friends, Ruby and Winter and uh, Jean and everyone that she's made a connection with. So her memory lives on, even in death. Let's see, we get that like, that soft bit here. Mm. Yeah, she found like, life was a struggle, maybe she wasn't ready for, but she was able to get through it because of her bonds with her friends. And her want to make everyone happy. And yeah, in the end it was worth it. Because she got a friend. And she did everything for those friends. And yes, I am tearing up again. God damn it. Uh, and Penny was just such a fun character. I love her so much. And it is going to be sad to... For her to have gone... She always, she always was alive. No matter everything about her, she was the real girl deep down. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I mean, I really did love that song. I've talked about it before and talked about it here. It's like fantastic instrumentation. Love the fact that it was so bubbly and bright, but it did have that like uh, that. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an impactful song. Um, and yeah, I I, I don't want to go on too long because I've already talked to you enough in this video. So uh, yeah, what a perfect song for a perfectly tender, sweet, loving character brought to life wonderfully by Casey in the instrumentation. Um, yeah. So uh, we're gonna end with a pretty cool thing here. We're gonna end with a song that wasn't made for Ruby, but it's got Casey in it. It worked for the scene that it was in. So, uh, yeah, let's wrap this up with uh, listening to OK Goodnight by Awake. So, for the last time in this video, count it down with me. Three, two, one. Uh, I love this song. So goddamn much. Like, next to uh, another OK Goodnight song of theirs, um, Rapture. This is probably my favorite from them. 
definitely go check out OK Goodnight, all of their songs. Casey just fantastic job there, and everyone there involved in the band as well. And uh, while this is going on, I'm going to say one thing. Cal, Arnold, this should have been in the best song category for the Oscars. Yes, I know that it wasn't made for, uh, for Ruby, and um, that probably was the reason why you didn't include it. But it still was a part of Ruby. It did still make some connections to Cinder. And uh, if Guardians of the Galaxy can be up for best score at the Game Awards, even though it's, its OST is mostly licensed songs... Why can't this one? <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 that was one thing I wish I brought up when uh, us three and um, I think it was Everless Fury was talking in uh, behind the scenes for some of the nominations for the Oscars. I wish I had brought this up when I saw it, but I completely forgot. So yeah, I think this should have been at least in contention for it because it was still a part of the show. And it is a freaking awesome song. Like this guitar at the start is freaking rocking as hell. Uh, this, I mean, yes, the connections to Ruby and to Cinder, because this was playing during um, the fight against Rhodes in Midnight, is extremely loose. That's probably why the only bit that we did get was the bit that made at least a small connection. Um, But I think some of this still does work for Cinder and for Ruby as well. Like the whole series as well. I got a lot of stuff in my eye at the moment. I'm sorry. Yeah, but they're talking about like a darkness and like, um, I'm ready to set free. Cinder was wanting to be set free from her shackles at the Madame's place to feel alive and to find her own place in the world. And it did come with a lot of darkness, as that's why this is a still a very dark song. It's almost like. Some of like past songs on this album, like Friend, um, Be Strong and Hit Stuff, they had that dark edge, but they kind of lean more towards the positive side because it was uplifting. This leans more into like the really darker stuff because it was like fully aware of like the struggles that Cinder went through, and she did kind of uh, take the dark path on her exit of um, reclaiming her life. And I, I get this is fantastic song. It's a it's a long one, so you have to get through a bit, but it's wicked cool. I mean, embers. What? This does fit in some way. And so bright, yeah. It's not kind. Cinder is flames that are very not unkind. Darkness, my tears collide, sinking into the shrine of me. I'm ready to be set free. I'm sick as the die in the air I breathe. I, I mean, I love this song. It's on my iTunes, and I've listened to it so many times. And this is my favorite next to Rapture that they've done. And it's building up to a huge bit here, which was the bit we had in uh, the Ruby episode. Let the rocket is all hell. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, actually, no. Misread it a little bit there. And. Yep. Deadly. She killed a lot of people, ended lives, cut lives silent. She was uh, ripped apart by the lies of being protected by the madams and by guided by roads, betrayed by them. She's kissing the innocents goodbye to become a darker person. She's lost any positive hopes in her. And she kind of like killed the life that was Cinder, the slave, to become Cinder, the, the girl who finally has control of her life again. The one thing I do wish we had in that flashback was seeing how Cinder and Salem cross paths. Maybe that will be something that we get to explore later on. But that flashback did a lot of good, like, finally giving some context to her motivations and explored that how Cinder is a tragic character, just manipulated and won over too much by the need to be strong because she was never strong for most of her life. Gentle. And she's starting to feel maybe conflicted, but then she commits once again to the anger. The air I breathe. <laughs> I feel alive. Ah! 
I again can I say enough that I love this song? <laughs> Flipping Casey colors it again. She finally was awake. She finally had control of her life. And as chaotic as the music is, it kind of shows that she's going into a darker path. Ah, oh, love that so much. Oh my god, yeah, fantastic song. Again, I wish it was kind of like given a bit more respect, even though it was like an out of context song and very separated from Ruby by that small bit. I don't know if it would have won in the best uh, best song Oscars because I think Friend was like such a good song and obviously the current context of Penny's death. Uh, but yeah, this should have at least been in the nominations, Cal. Arnold, come on. I mean, I'm sad myself that I didn't, like, point that out to you guys uh, before the votes were, like, starting to tally up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I freaking love this song. And overall, this is a really good OST. Um, again, there are some, like, maybe a few down points, but not, not in the sense, like, I hate it. It's just, like, stuff that maybe could have been stronger or maybe a little bit more expanded, but... Again, I'm working with the context of what's going on in the world, uh, the context of the scenes that they do kind of attach to. Again, I, I, the fact that I really defended the truth and like how much I really like that. And again, I hope people who are let down by the shortness don't ignore the quality of the song. Uh, in terms of what is my favorite, it is probably Be Strong and Hit Stuff. Um, but I also, again, love Friend. I really love The Wake, as obvious as it is here. Um... And finally, I'm just glad that we got this. This is something that we have been craving for for months on end now. Um, and I, yeah, it, it's just nice to get this. There's a lot of quality to be had as ever with Casey and Jeff. And I'm very excited to see the kind of music that comes with Volume 9. Because it's apparently going to be a trippy one. And I'm very excited to see how that translates into the music. But uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap this up now because this is a long video. Um... Again, much love to uh, Jeff, Casey, uh, Lamar, uh, Alex on the episode scores, everyone else who worked on that as well. I know Casey has got some credits for the scores as well. Uh, big shout outs to every single person that has worked on this OST and making sure that we did get it in the end. Um, I hope everything goes well in terms of their personal lives and dealing with the current struggles going on in the world and everything else beyond. Again, thank you so much for giving us so many incredible songs not just in this ost but for years on end and i cannot wait to see what comes next uh but you guys let me know what you guys thought about uh all of these songs which one's your favorite which ones you would have liked more on uh do you agree with some of the stuff that i was discussing in terms of like context or reasonings uh let me know all of that in the comments down below and while you're at it hit the subscribe and bell buttons Tick the notification box to make sure you get every new video from me as they drop. And follow me on Twitter at TheKaitoDan for more on anything to do with Ruby, updates on the channel, and more. But until next time, we're starting off with two, uh, 2020 on a, uh, 2022 on a big note. <laughs> and hopefully the rest of the year uh, goes strong as well. But until then, have a good day or a good night. And peace out. Yeah.